How's everybody doing today? If I lose my voice, then I'll just keep going on. Don't worry. The joys of having a big mouth. I have never completely lost my voice, so if you have your fingers crossed that I'll lose it, it may not work, so we'll see. All right, so I hope everybody had a good week, and I hope everybody's got a big weekend of studying biochemistry all planned. Um, has everybody gotten the textbook? Anybody not been able to download it? No problems? That's good to hear, good to hear. Um, the textbook uh, will eventually be uh, available in an iPad format, and uh, we're still in the process of putting all that together. It may not get done until closer till the end of the term, but uh, that's the idea of the textbook, is it'll be a, uh, an electronic one, and it'll, it's formatted for iPad, and it'll be distributed by Apple. So we're really excited about that, and hope that you guys like what you see. If you have comments or thoughts on that, we certainly appreciate uh, hearing from you. So, okay. Um, Today we're going to start talking about amino acids because amino acids lead, lead us into proteins and proteins are where all the action is at. As I've said earlier in this class, proteins are the workhorses of the cell. They do all of the essential things that cells need to do and we, we spend a fair amount of time talking about them both from the most simplest considerations which are their building blocks up to their much more complex considerations which include the four levels of structure that proteins have. And we'll be talking about that next week. Today we're going to be talking about, for the most part, are amino acids, their uh, properties as regards their ionization, the kinds of things we've been talking about, whether the proton's on or off, how that affects their charge. And then we'll say, I'll say a little bit today about peptide bonds, which is the, uh, what result when you join two amino acids together. Okay? So, um, let us um, think about amino acids, okay? Well, in organic chemistry, you learn that carbons are kind of cool in the sense that they can make four individual bonds with four molecules. And if they make bonds with four different molecules, there's two different ways in three-dimensional space that those molecules can exist, okay? You probably learned about what stereoisomers are. Now, I have some good news for you, and the good news is Biochemists are really lazy people, okay? We are really lazy people, so we don't even do, we don't mess with R and S and things like that, okay? Everybody's smiling when I say that. That's the first time I've seen you guys smile like this. So we keep stereoisomeric considerations fairly simple, okay? And DNL is probably going to be as much as you're going to hear about that, and I'm not going to expect you to look at this and say this is a D and this is an L. That's not what this is about but simply recognizing the fact that these, kind of, these guys can exist in two different ways. Okay? Two different ways they can exist in three-dimensional space. Very important consideration. Okay. Well, if you look at these two guys here, here's D-glyceraldehyde, L-glyceraldehyde. We look at the individual atoms on this molecule, and what we see, in fact, is that... <coughs> sorry. What we see is that everybody lines up, except for these guys right here. Okay? We see they're sort of flipped. You've seen this in organic chemistry before. You know that. And that... Uh, are the two representations in three-dimensional space that we can have, of course. So that's a really good uh, uh, depiction of that stereoisomeric property that we have for amino acids. Okay? This figure shows a schematic representation that will represent essentially, and I, I put a little asterisk by that, but it will represent essentially all of the amino acids. Okay? Now, um, if I look at this, there's some names I would give to things here. Okay? So this guy right here, this carbon right here is the one that has four things attached to it. That's the reason that there is asymmetry, stereoisomeric considerations with these guys. All right? This guy's called the alpha carbon. All right? So the alpha carbon right here, the alpha carbon has four things attached to it. And there's only one exception to that. I'll also give that in a minute as well. We see them depicted schematically on this uh, figure. We see that the four things are a hydrogen. We see that one of the things is an amine group. We see that one of the things is an R group, and R is where the variability occurs. And we see that one thing is a carboxyl group. Now, those four things, okay, are what make up an amino acid. Now, I said there's some terms. There's the alpha carbon. 
This guy over here, we call it the alpha amine. So we have the alpha carbon, we have the alpha amine, and this guy over here, we call the alpha carboxyl. So alpha, alpha, alpha. You're going to hear a lot of alpha today. Okay. Now, this you can use to represent all 20 amino acids. All right. All 20 amino acids can be represented by this guy right here. The only place the amino acids differ, again with one minor exception, the only place they differ is right here, the composition of the R group. All right. Now, this R group can be a methyl group. This R group can be a chain of carbons. Okay. This R group can be a hydrogen. And if this R group is a hydrogen, then we don't have four different things attached to it. And that's the only one, the only amino acid that is not asymmetric, does not have stereoisomeric forms. Okay? This is the only one that's in that category, and that amino acid is known as glycine. And yes, I think you should know that glycine is the simplest amino acid because its R group is only an H. Now, I told you I wasn't going to make you memorize a bunch of structures, and I'm not. But some of the basic things that I'm telling you about structure, yes, I think you should know. And I'll point these out as I go along. Okay, well, there are, as I said earlier in class, 20 amino acids that comprise all the proteins in biology. And again, there's a little minor asterisk there. There is, in fact, something called the 21st amino acid, but we're not going to talk about it here. We'll talk about it later in the term. Okay. 20 amino acids that essentially comprise all of the proteins that exist in nature. We use the same amino acids to make proteins that bacteria use that yeast use, that dogs use, that cats use. Everybody's using the same ones. Now, not only are we using the same amino acids, we're using the same amino acids in exactly the same configuration. We are all using amino acids in the L configuration. And yes, that's a very important point. If you remember your organic chemistry, you know that if you go into a laboratory and you chemically synthesize an amino acid, what happens is you get a mixture. Half of them are in the D form and half of them are in the L form, right? So how is it that biology has only the L form? How does it manage to do that? Well, if you think about it, D and L have specific three-dimensional configurations, right? specific three-dimensional configurations. Enzymes that make them have specific three-dimensional configurations. And so the enzymes that make them have a specific configuration that will only make L-form amino acids. All right? Now that's really cool because that becomes a common language, as it were, for amino acids in nature. If I gobble up a protein that was made by another organism, my body is set up for L amino acids. How convenient. So was that organism's. So basically, all of life is designed so that the rest of life can eat each other. That's a pretty good thing, right? Okay. We all like to eat each other. Now there are, again, as, as there almost always is, but there are, again, some minor exceptions to those, and I'll tell you about those later. And they're kind of interesting where occasionally there are D amino acids. They exist in biology for the most part as a result of a defense strategy of an organism. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so so far you've learned that there are 20 amino acids. You've learned that they all have the L configuration with the exception of glycine, which doesn't have different stereoisomeric forms. What I want to do now is talk about categorizing these amino acids. Now, I'm not going to make you memorize the structures of the amino acids, but I do think you should know the names of all the amino acids. That is, all the 20 that exist in proteins. You should know the names. If I say leucine, I think you should know, hey, that was an amino acid that exists in a protein. I think that's reasonable. Okay? I think further that you should know which category the amino acids fit into. So I'm going to give you four categories. All right? 
One category, the very first one, is what we call the hydrophobic. We've already talked about what hydrophobic means. It means these amino acids have an R group that doesn't like water. Has an R group that doesn't like water. Now, I'm showing you four categories of amino acids. All right? Different books use six categories, eight categories. Some even move them between categories. So if you look at a different book and you, and you look at a book and you say, hey, that's not the categories they use, that's fine. Realize that different books use different designations. We're using these designations right here. So this is what I will hold you responsible for is this, okay? All right, so nonpolar amino acids. Nonpolar meaning that they don't, they can't form hydrogen bonds. They don't ionize. And if I were just to put them alone in water, they didn't like water very much. Okay. Well, there's leucine. All right. Leucine, if we look at it, exists right here. It's a little hard to see in the designation, but that guy right there in the center is the alpha carbon. The alpha carbon has an alpha carboxyl over here. It has an alpha amine. It has a hydrogen, and it has an R group. And look at that R group. When you see nothing hanging off of it, those are just carbons and hydrogens, meaning there's nothing in that R group that will form hydrogen bonds. And therefore, that R group really doesn't like water very much. I'm not asking you to memorize this structure. All right? I simply want you to know that leucine is a hydrophobic amino acid. Now, there's a reason I'm making you understand which amino acids are in which category. And the reason I'm doing that is what we will see is that proteins arrange their amino acids according to their category. All right, some really cool things that they do, and it's not complicated, especially if you know the categories. All right, so leucine fits in that first category. All right, I'll just briefly step you through them. Proline. Proline's one of the odd ones, and proline looks like this, and you say, whoa, that doesn't look like the other ones you talked about. Well, this was one of those minor asterisks that I talked about. All right. In this case, what has happened is the R group, there's the alpha, alpha carbon right there, the R group extends over, 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 and then look, it's become attached to the alpha amine group. So in this case, the alpha amine actually became attached to the R group. That's the only one that does that. Every other alpha amine is free. It's not attached to something else. All right? So proline has that characteristic, and proline turns out to be a really interesting amino acid in this respect. Okay? If we think about it, we had single bonds between the alpha carbon and the alpha carboxyl. We had a single bond between the alpha carbon and the um, alpha amine. And they could rotate any way they wanted to, right? Well, look here. Here's the alpha carbon, right? Here's the alpha carbon. And I can rotate the alpha carbon to the alpha carboxyl just fine. But if I try to rotate the alpha carbon to the alpha amine, what's going to happen? The ring's not going to let it rotate. This is the least flexible of all the amino acids. Proline is the least flexible. I do think you should know proline okay, has this odd ring structure. And that leads to its being inflexible. That inflexibility leads to some interesting structures inside of proteins. Okay. I like this. I'll put up this language here. Oh, man, it doesn't even say much. Okay. I was hoping it's going to say a lot. All right. Alanine. Now I'm just going to step through them. This has a simple R group. All right. And again, uh, I'm not actually asking you to know the structure, so don't sweat that. I have a valine. Okay. A little bit more. Valine is not, not unlike leucine. It has a very similar R group. All these guys have fairly hydrophobic side chains. We put glycine in this category, but realistically, glycine doesn't fit into any category very well because... What's the characteristic of a hydrogen sticking off of a carbon? It doesn't really have much of a characteristic. So it's all lonely by itself, so we put it with the hydrophobics. Methionine. Methionine gets, to be, um, gets in here, and it's an unusual one. All right? It has a hydrophobic side chain. It's the first one that you've seen that has sulfur in it. There are two amino acids that contain sulfur. This is one of them, and yes, you should know that. And the nature of this sulfur 
is different than the nature of the sulfur in the other amino acid that contains one. This sulfur is bound to two carbons, a carbon here and a carbon here. That makes that sulfur very unreactive. It's not a very reactive sulfur at all. We'll see one place later in the term where it will react, but for the most part, it's a fairly unreactive sulfur. Okay. Tryptophan. There's the alpha carbon. Look at the side chain there. Big honking side chain. Okay. Big honking side chain. We'll see later that big honking side chains cause proteins to have some characteristics that are interesting. Phenylalanine, big honking side chain. Not quite as big as tryptophan, but still pretty good th sized thing hanging off the edge there. Ta uh, loose isoleucine, sorry. Isoleucine, as its name implies, is related to leucine. It's simply a rearrangement of the carbons off that alpha carbon right there. All right. Um, polar amino acids. When I say polar, I hope that you're thinking, hey, forms hydrogen bonds. It's hydrophilic. It must have something that forms hydrogen bonds with water readily. And when we look at cerium, we can say, yep, you betcha it does, because right there is our friend, the alpha, carbio, the, I'm sorry, the alpha carbon. And you can see there's a carbon attached to an OH. And you know that OHs will form hydrogen bonds nicely with water. Okay? Asparagine. All right? Asparagine looks like this guy. There's the alpha carbon. And there is a, what looks like, it's actually, it's called an amide right there, or I'm sorry, a carboxyamide right there. That guy has a carbon double bonded to an oxygen bonded to this. I'm not asking you to draw the structure, don't worry, okay? This guy will form hydrogen bonds with water nicely. Okay. Glutamine. Similar to asparagine, there's another one of those carboxyamides right out there. Forms hydrogen bonds readily with water. Threonine. Threonine is kind of like serine. It's got a hydroxyl hanging out there. And that hydroxyl will form hydrogen bonds with water. Tyrosine. Tyrosine, uh, sometimes people put tyrosine in other categories. Sometimes ty they put tyrosine and phenylalanine and tryptophan into a category they call aromatic because they, they all have aromatic rings. I kind of like to put this into the um, polar because it's got a hydroxyl out there that can, that can form uh, hydrogen bonds with water. So, again, depending upon which book you see, they'll put it in different categories. And last but not least, in the polar category, we have this really interesting amino acid I'm going to say a few words about. It's the other sulfur-containing amino acid. This sulfur-containing amino acid is cysteine. Okay? Now, look at the nature of the sulfur in this amino acid. It exists as an SH. It's called a sulfhydryl. I like your computer cover. That's cool. I just noticed that. That's kind of, yeah. Cinderella. I'm sorry, Snow White Snow holding, 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 well, they're all, Snow White holding the apple. That's kind of cool. Okay. Um, SH, all right? SH stands for something else, and we're not going to say what that something else is here. But maybe you'll think the same thing when you think of SH. I don't know. But this SH right here has some very reactive chemical properties. Okay. Two things it can do very well. One, it can ionize, meaning it can give off a proton and be left as an S minus. So here's a guy that can ionize. It means it's a weak acid. It has a pKa value. It can ionize. It becomes an S minus. That's one thing that can happen to it in water. The other thing that can happen to it is this SH is very reactive, that is, it will combine with another SH and get oxidized very readily. When it combines with another SH, it makes what's called a disulfide bond. I'll show you that later, in, uh, probably next week, so don't sweat that right now. But I want you to keep in your back of your head that this guy will react with another sulfur, and that turns out to be a very important consideration in giving proteins some stability. Okay. Okay, so that's the first one that we've seen that will ionize. Let's look at two more that will ionize, okay? Aspartic acid. 
The name acid should kind of give away for you, right? Aspartic acid. It's a weak acid. Why do we call it aspartic acid? Well, if we look at the R group, there's the alpha carbon. I'm sorry, the, al the alpha carbon there. There's the alpha carboxyl. There's the alpha amine. Look at the R group. It's got another acid in it. So aspartic acid has a second carboxyl in it, and that second carboxyl can ionize just like the alpha carboxyl can ionize. If this guy ionizes, then what happens to it is it becomes a COO minus. Okay? All right. Yeah, yeah. Anything that, can, anything that can ionize is polar by its very nature, okay. but it's more than polar, it's an ion. Just like I would say that potassium is polar, but, I wouldn't, I, but it's also an ion, right? So if you were to describe it, you would describe it as polar, but I would not put it in the polar category because I'm using that, yeah, I'm, I'm not using that in, that in that sense, okay? All right, glutamic acid. Very similar to aspartic acid, there's another carboxyl. So we see that the R group in both of these has a carboxyl. This R group can ionize in both cases. Okay. Okay, now, everything that we've talked about so far can ionize and lose a proton. And when it loses a proton, the group goes from a charge of zero to a charge of minus one, right? If I have, uh, let's go back to aspartic acid, okay? Let's go to aspartic acid. We've got a carboxyl here. If it loses its proton, it becomes a minus one. If here's a carboxyl in the R group, if it loses its proton, it becomes a minus one, so the total would be a minus two, right? One of the things I haven't told you so far is that there's yet something else in amino acids that can ionize. These are the amine groups. Alpha amines can ionize. Now, they ionize differently than the carboxyls do. How do they ionize? They ionize when they have an extra proton. When they have an extra proton. So in, if we have an amine group that has an extra proton, instead of being NH2, it's going to be NH3. And in that case, it has an NH3 plus because it has gained a proton, right? NH3 plus. When this guy loses its proton, it goes from a plus one to a zero. Notice the difference. This guy goes from NH3 to an NH2, goes from one to zero. This guy loses a proton, it goes from zero to minus one. Don't confuse that. Because they're not. Have you lost your voice too? No. I say if, I, if you've not, I'll have you come up when I, when I lose mine, you can finish the lecture off. How's that? Okay? Everybody understand that difference? The two possibilities for an amine are plus one and zero. Plus one protons on, plus, I'm sorry, zero protons off. The two possibilities for a carboxyl are zero and minus one. Zero when the proton's on, minus one when the proton's off. Basic organic chemistry. Okay. Well, we had R groups that could ionize and lose protons and become minus one. Do we have R groups that can have amine groups? And the answer is yes, we do. Okay? Now, I reluctantly use the term basic here. And I, to be honest with you, I don't like using it, but I don't have a better name for categorizing these guys. You notice I said I don't want to use the term base in class unless it's a strong base. Well, we're calling these basic because they have R groups that have amines in them. They have R groups that have amines in them. Now, what this guy does right here is if it has an extra proton on it, the R group has a charge of plus one. And if the R group loses that proton, it has a charge of zero. Histidine is one of those. There are three amino acids that we categorize in the basic category. They include histidine, lysine, there's the R group with the amine. And last but not least, arginine. Arginine's right here. It looks like it has two that could gain, but only, in fact, one of these guys actually gains a proton. Okay. 
So in summary, what have we seen? We saw hydrophobic amino acids, meaning they didn't like water. We saw hydrophilic or polar amino acids, meaning they did like water. We saw acidic amino acids, which means that they can ionize and uh, lose that proton off of a carboxyl. I should point out, the, the, the cysteine also could lose that proton, right? But the, carbo the, the acidic ones have a carboxyl in their R group. The basic ones have some kind of an amine in their R group. Four categories of amino acids. You should know which category each amino acid fits into. Now, I can tell you when we go to calculate the charge of proteins that you're going to need to know which amino acids have R groups that can ionize. I've given you six of them. They're actually about seven or eight, but we're not going to worry about all of them. I'm going to, I've given you six. Three of them are basic, histidine, lysine, arginine. Two of them were what I called acidic, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. And one of them we actually put in the polar category, and that was cysteine. So those six amino acids all have R groups that can ionize. All have R groups that can ionize. Now that's going to become very important when we later try to determine the charge of a protein. Okay, I'll stop for a second. Take any questions. I'm doing all the babbling here. You guys look tired. You up for a joke? Okay. This is one of my favorite jokes. All right. It's about Artie the Hitman. You guys ever heard about Artie the Hitman? Little guy, he wants, to, he wants to be a hitman. Hitman wants to kill people, right? So he decides he wants to make a name for himself. So he goes out and he makes up his business card, Artie the Hitman, we'll kill for cheap, right? He goes, thank you, that's not the punchline yet, but he puts his business card all over town. He nails it up on the, all the phone, phone booths. He puts it on the barometer kiosk, but they tear it off, okay? That's a joke, too. You don't get it. Okay. But anyway, he puts his thing up all over town, we'll kill for cheap. And so this guy grabs the card and he's, he calls him up and he says, Artie, he says, I want you to kill somebody for me. Artie says, okay, what do you want? He says, I want you to kill my wife. He said, okay. He says, uh, how much are you going to charge me? And Artie says, well, I'm just getting started. I want to make a name for myself, so I'll do it for a buck. He says, okay, that's a pretty good deal. It gets better. He says, well, how much, how much are you going to charge me for this? And Artie says, um, he says, I'll do it for a dollar. He says, well, how do you want me to kill her? And he says, well, he says, um, I'd like you to strangle her. Okay, where's she at? Well, she's down at the grocery store right now. He says, could you uh, go do it down there? Sure. So he gets a description of what she's wearing and everything. And so Artie trucks down to the grocery store. And he gets down there, and he sees this lady, and she sure looks like the description, right? So he goes up, and he grabs the old lady, looks around. Nobody sees him, and he strangles her right there in the grocery store. Okay? It's a terrible story, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Innocent children I'm telling this story to, right? He strangles her right in the grocery store. And so he's all set. And he turns around. Oh, damn. There's the produce manager. And he's seen him. And he's got it. So he goes over and he grabs the produce manager. And he strangles him because he can't have a witness. So he's not going to be a hitman for very long, right? And he's about to make his way out. And he discovers, oh, there's my luck. There's, there's the guy that's the butcher. Okay? And the butcher has now seen me do this. So he grabs the butcher. And he strangles him right there in the supermarket. He looks around. He thinks he's safe. And he goes running out. And the police catch him. And the headlines in the newspaper the next day say, Artie chokes three for a dollar at the grocery store. <laughs> Artie chokes. That took a long time to set up. <laughs> I hope you guys appreciate that. All right. Abbreviations. Do you want to memorize these? Show of hands. Okay, then we won't memorize these, all right? I will not hold you responsible for knowing the abbreviations, all right? I will give you full names and you can give me full names. If you use, and by the way, one of my policies in the class is if you, you're welcome to use any abbreviation I use in class, all right? But if you use an abbreviation, it has to be exact. It has to be exact. So if you say, okay, I want to use ALA for uh, alanine and you put ALE, for example, we will count it wrong. 
So just a word to the wise, that's what we do with abbreviations. But you're welcome to use any abbreviation that I use. Okay. All right, there are, as I said, 20 amino acids that occur naturally in proteins. We also find a few other amino acids in proteins but almost always they are there because they have been modified after they were put into the protein. So here's a real good example. Hydroxyproline okay, gets put into a protein as proline, and then an enzyme comes along and modifies it and puts a hydroxyl on it, which makes hydroxyproline. Hydroxylysine, same thing. Okay. It gets put in as lysine, an enzyme comes along, puts a hydroxyl group on it, and it's that. So when I say 20 amino acids, that's the way they get put in, is as 20 different amino acids. And we see some modifications happening to amino acids as we go along. We also see some derivatives of amino acids that are involved in various um, uh, roles in our body, many of them acting as hormones. Here is serotonin. Serotonin is involved in uh, sleep, for example, sleep. Uh, and serotonin is derived from tryptophan. Okay? One of the things that people say, and I don't know if it's true or not, but people claim that the reason everybody gets sleepy after Thanksgiving dinner is they have eaten a lot of turkey. And I don't know if this works for vegetarians or not. It probably doesn't. But they've eaten a lot of turkey, and turkey is very rich in tryptophan, and so their body is making a ton of serotonin, and so now it's time to go take a nap. I don't know if that's true or not. But you can see serotonin is related to tryptophan. What's that? Not true, yeah, so, yeah, that's why I say, but I just I like spreading urban legends around, so. Okay, here's uh, a couple of cool ones here. Uh, L-DOPA is used uh, by your, um, by your, um, um, I'm sorry, dopamine is used by, I say L-DOPA, L-DOPA is used to treat it, but dopamine is used by your brain as a neurotransmitter. It's uh, giving you good, happy feelings. It's made from tyrosine. And dopamine is a precursor of this very important hormone called epinephrine. And epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. And it's the stuff that gives you superhuman powers when you're in danger. And it really does. We'll, we'll see later in the term about why you get superhuman powers when your body is making epinephrine. So tyrosine is used to make epinephrine. All right. Well, so much for structure. I want to spend some time talking about ionizing of these guys. That's what the, the, the thrust of our uh, discussion so far has been, ionizing. Here's a representation of a simple amino acid. Okay? This simple amino acid has an alpha carboxyl group. It has an alpha amine group. And in this case, it just has an R that doesn't have anything ionizing on it. Okay. If we start this guy, and this is the way I will frequently start thinking about them, is if we start this guy with all the protons on, meaning everything that can gain a proton gains a proton, it looks like what we see on the left. The carboxyl has a proton on it, and when the carboxyl has a proton on it, you should remember from your organic chemistry, that's a charge of zero. And the amine has a proton on it, and when it gets its extra proton on it, it has a charge of plus one. So the overall charge of this amino acid would be plus one. Okay. Let's imagine we're doing that titration we were talking about the other day, and you guys told me what that titration would look like. It would go up, it would flatten, it would go up, it would flatten, it would go up again, right? And the two flattenings would correspond to the two places where the protons came off. All right? And the two flattenings would correspond to the pKa values of each of those ionizing groups. Does everybody remember that? Say yes. Yes. You're supposed to do like a church. Yeah. Yeah. Some enthusiasm. You guys are a dull group. We should have happy hour, shouldn't we? It's... All right. If I told you that carboxyl groups, alpha carboxyl groups on average have a pKa value around 2.2, and that alpha amine groups had a pKa value around 9.5. And no, I'm not going to ask you to memorize those two. Okay? But if I told you that right now, which one would lose the proton first? As I started at a low pH and I raised it. The carboxyl, right? Because I'm going to go through its pKa value first. And that's exactly what you see here. You cheated, didn't you? No, OK. All right. 
we see that the carboxyl loses its proton first, the amine group still has its proton on there. Okay? This has a pKa of 2.34. It varies with the amino acid, but that's, that's close enough. All right? This guy has a charge of, a net charge of zero, minus one, plus one. It's something we call a Zwitter ion. Z W I T T E R I O N. A student in this class, I think it was last year, educated me on the German meaning of this word. I see some smiles. People know what that means in German? It means hermaphrodite. It has both. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it's got an ion here and it's got an ion over here. Okay. A Zwitter ion is a molecule whose charge adds up to zero. So what a Zwitter ion is. Okay. All right. Well, if we keep raising the pH, we get up into the high pH as we see that the other proton comes off, and when the other proton comes off, we have a molecule that has a charge of minus here, zero here, or a total all, overall charge of minus one. Okay? Clear as mud? Okay. Let's think about this. Okay. This is what that plot's going to look like. All right? We start at a very low pH. Notice we're plotting pH on the y-axis. We're plotting moles of OH per mole of amino acid on the x-axis. We start down here. All the protons are on. That's how we started that guy, right? We get to this point right here, and this is where you're going to screw up because here's where you're going to say, well, the proton's off there. No, it's not. It's half off there. Half off, right? Why is it half off? Well, half of the molecules have this structure, and half of the molecules have this structure. And if you think about that acetic acid solution we had, we said we had half salt and half acid, right? Look at this. Half salt and half acid. That happens right here. Make sense? We get up here. We've pulled this proton all the way off, and we have only this guy. That's shown right here. That's our Zwitter ion. Okay? Only half of the guys are Zwitter ions here. Here, everybody's a Zwitter ion. Yeah? I'll, I'll, I'll say pi in a second. Okay? We keep raising the pH. There's that stupid bouncing ball. We keep raising the pH, and we see, OK, we're getting into another buffering region. And looky here. We've got half salt and half acid, right? Now look, here is the salt. I'm sorry, here's the acid. Here's the salt. How can I tell the difference between those? What's the difference between a salt and an acid? A proton. A proton. Which has the most protons? That guy. That must be the acid. That must be the salt. Notice the guy who's the acid here was the salt down here. Depends on which system we're talking about, whether it's a salt or an acid. The ones that have the most protons will be the, will be the acids. The ones that have the least protons will be the salts. Well, we're half and half. We keep raising the pH. We get out of the buffering region. And we're left only with this guy up here that's a charge of minus 1. Now, I think you should be able to draw and interpret graphs like this. I'm going to tell you what pi is in a second. Okay? But these are fairly straightforward. Fairly straightforward. Protons are coming off one at a time. Yeah? Why does the uh, carboxylic acid lose the proton before being amine? Because it has a lower p His question was, why does the carboxylic acid lose its proton before the amine? It's because the carboxylic acid has a pKa that's lower. pKa determines, if you recall, pKa determines the strength of an acid. Now, here's why I don't like to use the term basic. And thank you for asking the question. Here's why I don't like to use the term basic. The reason I don't like to is because that amine group is an acid. You've been thinking all along that's a basic group, but in fact it's an acid because what did it do? It gave up its proton. Right? It's just an extraordinarily weak acid. Its pKa value was 9 and not a pKa value of 2.3. Make sense? Other questions about this? 
You're going to be responsible for these, so I want to make sure you understand them. Should I tell you about PI? What's PI? PI has a definition I'm going to give you first. PI is the pH at which a molecule has a charge of exactly zero. I'll explain why I use that word exactly zero in a moment. But the PI is a pH. It's a special pH. It's a pH at which a molecule has a charge of exactly zero. Okay. Isoelectric means it doesn't have any charge. Okay. Isoelectric, no charge. All right. Now, I'm going to show you a cool trick to use with this, but I have to show you this because it's in showing you this that you realize why I use the word exactly with PI. Okay? We're going to find that when we look at amino acids in a protein, that most of the charge of a protein doesn't come from the alpha carboxyl or the alpha amine, but most of it comes from the R groups. Most of it comes from the R groups. Okay? And we never have a protein biologically where we have a pH, for example, of zero, at least not an active protein. Okay? So we like to have some shortcuts to decide, is the proton on or is the proton off? Simple is good, right? Well, we learned a rule about pKa last time. What was the rule about buffering in pKa? What did we decide? The, what was the buffering range? Plus or minus 1. So the buffering range when you went from 1 pH unit below to 1 pH unit above the pKa. And if we were in that range, if the pH was in that range, we had buffering. We make some assumptions here. For simplicity purposes, if we are estimating charge of a molecule, we say that if the pH... And here's one thing I will not put you on your exam, so you should have this in your head. The so pH is one or more units below the pKa, that is outside that range, below that range, the proton is on. This is only good for estimating purposes, most of which we'll use in the class. If the pH is more than one unit above the pKa, that is above that range, then we will be, the proton will be off for the purposes of estimating. Now, this gives us simplicity. It really does. Let's say, you don't have to look at this graph. You can think this through in your head. And I like thinking things through in my head. Okay? The thing I'm thinking through in my head is this. I've got an alpha carboxyl. I've got an alpha amine. I put all the protons on, what's the charge of the molecule? One, right? One from the amine, zero from the carboxyl, right? I told you that the alpha carboxyl has a pKa of 2.2. Let's say I, I said, what is the approximate charge in this molecule at pH 1? How would you decide? Well, let's think about it. I've got a pKa of 2.2 for the alpha carboxyl. I've got a 9.5 for the alpha amine, right? One is more than one unit below the pKa of the carboxyl, and it's more than one unit below the pKa of the amine. So both those protons are going to be on, right? That's close. <laughs> All right. They're both going to be on, charge of plus one. What if I said, how about at pH four, what's the charge? What's that? Approximately zero. Right? Notice the approximately. Right? There's only one pH where it's exactly zero. And that pH where it's exactly zero is called the PI. I'll show you how we calculate that in a minute. All right. What if I had a pH of 8? What's the charge? Approximately zero, right? That is, we're still more than one unit below the pKa of the amine. We're still more than one unit above the pKa of the carboxyl. So we're still approximately zero. That's why we have to calculate the exact place. Right? 
If I told you I had a pH of 71, which is a little hard to get, but let's say we had a pH of 71, we would all agree that both protons would be off, and the molecule would have a charge of minus 1. This rule of estimating charge turns out to be really useful. Okay? You'll see in some problems I'm going to give you that, in fact, if you look at the practice exams where you have to calculate the charge of a protein, you'll see that rule comes in really handy. All right. Now, how do I calculate PI? All right. PI stands for the isoelectric point, as I noted earlier. And the PI will always be, and I want you to get this right, okay? You guys can say, I bet you it's the average of those two guys right there. And the answer is, yes, it is. But what if you have three different lumps? Oh, man. I know, I'll just average all three. No, all right? I want to have this whole class set a record for me, all right? I always say don't do that, okay? It doesn't make sense, and I'll explain why in a second. You're not going to average all three. I would like for this entire class, nobody is going to average all three if I give you one that has all three on the exam, all right? If this entire class makes it through and does not do that, um, I'll do something. I don't know. What should I do? <laughs> this is this back to this everybody wants an A business, right? You know? But everybody doesn't want an A. You only want an A for yourself. No. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I can't do that. Okay. So let's give something I can do. What can I do? Ice cream with the midterm. <laughs> you know that classes always have a one-track mind. You ever notice that? I mean, something like, why don't you wear a red tie tomorrow? Or why don't you, you know, get up in front of class and pick your nose or something I can do, you okay, know? I've got one. All right. We used to videotape you for five minutes doing whatever we choose in your class. <laughs> I'd like to define what the term whatever means. <laughs> because... Knowing how classes are, they all have a one-track mind about that, I have a feeling, as well. Oh, you know, you know, with, I'll tell you what happens, you know. I have this very fluffy stuff down here because I have nothing up here, right? And the reason I like this fluffy stuff down here is I'm always afraid if I cut it off, it'll never come back out. <laughs> I did do a bet with my students last year. They got to, they got to dye my hair blue. That happened. Um, let's, let's think about something. I don't know. We'll, we'll, why don't you guys put your heads to it, and we'll think about something reas reasonable to do. And, and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll consider that. I, I think that's, that's not an unreasonable thing. Okay? So let's think about that. So, all right. Well, the question is that how do we calculate the PI if we have three flattening regions? All right. Well, it turns out it's very simple. We average the two around the place where the Zwitter ion is. Once we figure out where the Zwitter ion is, it's the two on either side of the Zwitter ion. That's very simple. Now, all it's going to take is, oh, oh, there's another thing about this also. So if one person does that, all right, then you guys have to do something for me. Oh! What's that? Just that one person. No, 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 no. All right. So, so we ha I have to think of something that, that you will have to do. So maybe okay, we can do the AF thing. So if one person does it, then you, everybody makes an F. No, no. I believe you guys can do it. All right. All right. Enough of that. You guys have that figured out, right? Are you ready for the song of the day? Yeah. All right, let's have the song of the day. This one I actually have a little help with because uh, I'm going to have somebody sing it with us. I think, hold on.
It's not there. All right, we're going to have to sing it ourselves. I'm sorry, I don't have the audio working for some reason. Ready? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Ready? Lysine, arginine, and his basic ones you should not miss. Alleluvel, I'll and met. Fill the aliphatic set. You see why I wanted somebody else to sing it. Proline, bends, and cis has S. Glycines, R is the smallest. Then there's terp and tire and fee, structured aromatically. Aspen, glue, side chains of R, say to protons, au revoir. Glutamine, asparagine, bear carboxamide amines, three anine and tiny ser have hydroxyl groups to share. These 20 amino A's can combine a zillion ways. Thank you. What was wrong with that? Hi. I will try to do that. Yes, I'm going to post some this weekend. Okay? You bet. Uh, going fine. How are you doing? Good. This is bugging me. I don't know if I'm just thinking what's wrong or not. Okay. DNA is made of amino acids, right? No, DNA is made of nucleotides. Thank you. I knew that was all. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking, because uh, it's uracil, diamine, and guanine, and I knew all those. But yep. I was thinking, I was thinking it was amino acids. I didn't see no, amino acids, no, no. I was like, wait a second. Nope. Okay. Nucleotides. You, okay, you bet. <laughs> That's how it's supposed to sound. 